Well, welcome to Washington once again. I'm former Congressman Joe Diavuati, the volunteer president of the Albanian American Civic League. This is a very important room for the Albanian people because this is the major hearing room for the Committee on International Relations. And this is where the issues that concern Albanians in the Balkans, or Albanians anywhere, even Albanian Americans, this is where we have to expose those issues to try to get uh, legislative action, hopefully signed by the president so that Albanians can get justice. And that's what this is all about. That's what Washington and the House of Representatives is all about. How do we bring fairness, justice to people? In this case, we're talking about the Albanian people. Uh, this is a, a very historic room for us because as you can see, as I point the camera, there's uh, the chairman's picture up there. That's uh, Congressman Henry Hyde on the wall. And uh, many of us were here for the unveiling of that portrait uh, last uh, May. And uh, he's the chairman, and many of you know that we were here on May 21st and had a very important hearing for the independence of Kosovo, co-chaired by Henry Hyde as the chairman and uh, Congressman Tom Lantos as the ranking member, and that is the number one Democrat on the committee. And here we have our old friend Ben Gilman, who uh, just retired, and uh, Ben is still a friend. He's now uh, the president's delegate to the General Assembly of the United Nations. And uh, with Ben, we still have uh, the um, attention that we need from important bodies, in this case now the United Nations. There's one other picture I'd like to show because many people forget that we had another important Democratic chairman, Dante Fussell. When I was a congressman back in 1985 to 89, it was Dante Fussell who allowed us to have the first hearing in 1987 for Albanian rights uh, in, in the former Yugoslavia. And that's the first hearing where we mentioned Kosovo. So this is kind of uh, a shrine or a museum for the Albanian people in many respects. Certainly it's part of my history as a, as a former congressman and now as a volunteer activist for the Albanian people. And here today we have a hearing on the, uh, the rights of Albanians in Montenegro. And we have Albanians from all over America. And as you can see, some Albanians are lost and they're calling me on my phone. We just have to wait. Uh, in any case, we have here Albanians from Atlantic City, from Detroit, from New York, from California. Uh, and they all have families in Montenegro. They are concerned about what is going on in Montenegro because their families have to live there every day. And what this is all about is to have a hearing so that representatives, Albanian representatives of that community, can talk about some of the issues that they feel need improvement. And uh, here's walking in now one of our friends, Congressman Dana Rohrbacher. Uh, he's a Republican, and he was nice enough to join us. And you know he's from California, and right now his district's on fire. I was out there this week, and you can imagine the problems he's had. Hey, Dana. Hey, Joe. Come over here and say hello to uh, <laughs> everybody. Know Dana Rohrbacher, yes. California, Republican. Good, good, good. Well, let me introduce a, uh, a great congressman. I was just in his district. Oh. But in any case, one of the most important things that we did this year was a hearing on the independence of Kosovo. And it was co-chaired by uh, Chairman Hyde and Congressman Tom Lantos. But I can tell you that uh, the person who really understands this issue, as well as anyone else, is Congressman Dana Rohrbacher. And the testimony he gave, his statement was so compelling. And maybe you'd like to say a few points about the Sovereign and why independence you think is important. Well, maybe we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to talk here okay. about today. Uh, you know, there are two major things that can bring peace to this world. And that is, if you do recognize people's human rights and their democratic, uh, their ability to make democratic decisions in the countries they live. And number two, that we respect people's right uh, to control their own destiny and for people to actually live in the country that they want to live in. And uh, in Kosovo, obviously, the people of Kosovo, uh, by the vast majority, want to have a country that reflects their values and that they believe that Kosovo is not part of Serbia. And uh, there's no doubt. I mean, it's, it's the vast, vast majority of people. Well, what's happening, we're putting off recognizing that fact our government is, hasn't been uh, willing to step forward because we don't want to have a crisis well in the end it's going to cause a horrible crisis because the people of serbia are being given the wrong message 
And the wrong message is that they have some chance to control Kosovo. Kosovo which is 95% Albania. And don't want to be part of Serbia. So it's a wrong message, and I'm afraid it's going to lead to a conflict. Now, the other important element in having a peaceful society is what? It's making sure we respect each other's human rights. And I would hope that those Serbs that want to stay in Kosovo, that their rights are, are absolutely that their rights are re, uh, respected, respected yes. that they're that they're not subject to brutality or and they're not uh, subject to harassment right. and that's important well that same thing is true of course of uh, Albanian and Albanians who live in Montenegro. in Montenegro or Serbia or, or wherever in Macedonia, and, Macedonia exactly. and that uh, we should be respecting the rights of, of our minorities and we should be respecting the rights of people to have their own country those are not contradictory, and uh, they're 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 two uh, you know two sides of the same coin, and so it's important today that uh, we make sure that Albanian people who live in these uh, countries uh, like Montenegro or, or Serbia that they understand that we aren't turning a blind eye, and that the and that the people in the rest of the country in those countries realize we care about the human rights of these people. But it's a consistent. It's a it consistent thing, Aaron, because we don't want anyone in any of these countries, any minority, to be mistreated. Exactly. And one of the subtle connections between the hearing we had in May and this hearing is that, as you know, the new constitution for the new state of Rump Yugoslavia called Serbia Montenegro says that Kosovo is part of that state. And this is very upsetting. Now, one of the reasons we wanted this was to show how Albanians are treated in Montenegro to demonstrate why they would resist becoming part of a state called Serbia and Montenegro because of the egregious human rights violations of that minority there. If they can't respect the minority that's there already, how are they going to respect another two million Albanians that they want to put in that state? Yes, well, it's, uh, if the United States does, uh, uh, doesn't uh, step up to the plate and start making some of these decisions, it should be easy for us to make the decision that wherever a minority group is, whether it's a Serbian minority group or, or an Albanian minority group, that we are not going to put up with anybody uh, traipsing on the human rights of these people right. and treating them badly. But at the same time, we need to step up to the plate and recognize that uh, Kosovo has a right to exist as an independent government because the vast majority of people, and they want that. They want that. They, and self-determination? They, sure, self-determination, just like we were uh, in our country. We, we were part of a, another country before. We had a right. thing called the Declaration of Independence. Yes. And our founding document starts out with uh, why we're trying to explain the right of people right. to determine their own destiny. Okay. And here we have Tom Lantos. Here's the great chairman, Congressman Tom Lantos, who's just joined us. I do take this here. Tom, welcome. I first want to welcome uh, former Congressman Joe Diogardi and his most able and lovely wife, Shirley Cloyes, and the board members of the Albanian American Civic League. Uh, I also want to welcome the witnesses who have traveled here from many places, including Montenegro. Uh, as you know, we had a remarkably interesting and informative and valuable trip to Montenegro uh, three months ago, and uh, it made a very deep impression on all of us who were part of this delegation. I want to uh, thank uh, Joe and Shirley for their dedication to human rights issues, uh, particularly of Albanians in Kosovo and throughout the Balkans, and for their work with uh, the Albanian American Civic League. I traveled to Montenegro uh, three months ago and uh, viewed the very troubling issues of inequality as it relates to the ethnic Albanian population of that country. The Albanian population in Montenegro today is half of what it was at the end of the Second World War. And there is very little attention paid to the Albanian people in Montenegro. 
Today we will hear from a number of expert witnesses who live in Montenegro, have, have traveled there extensively and studied the conditions. Uh, it was a great pleasure for me to meet a very wide range of Albanians living in Montenegro. I found them to be intelligent, competent, capable, and uh, in no way deserving the second-class status which the government is inflicting upon them. Uh, before we call our first witness, Dr. Neil Draga, uh, I would like to call on my friend and colleague uh, uh, who will uh, um, uh, take this microphone and express whatever views he has concerning this subject and the subject of uh, the Albanian population throughout the region. Congressman Rohrabacher. Let's note, this is real democracy. You got a liberal Democrat over there and a conservative Republican over here. And uh, uh, the one, if there's one great thing about America, it's that uh, we, well, we come from different mindsets and we come from different ethnic backgrounds and we come from different races, and we come from different religions. Uh, what ties us together is a commitment to liberty and justice for all. That's what we pledge every time we pledge to the flag. You know, we don't pledge to somebody's religion or somebody's ethnic background. And uh, we Americans have a special role to play in the world because of that. And our special role is to make sure that we are the champions of liberty and justice for all. Uh, in the Balkans, uh, we've uh, not always stepped up to the plate, and every time we haven't, uh, it's done damage to us. And in fact, throughout our history, whenever we don't stand up for the democratic and freedom and, uh, and those fundamental beliefs of treating people with decency, and uh, uh, we always end up losing because of it. Well, uh, today, we have to make sure that we don't lose sight of these because America has been lulled asleep again. We, uh, here we were 10 years ago in the middle of a crisis in the Balkans and all of a sudden people are paying attention. Now, people aren't paying attention again and things are slipping in the wrong direction and we need to go back to the fundamentals. America believes that if the people of Kosovo want by such a large majority to become a state, they should be a state because they have a right through self-determination to become a state. If the Serbs in Serbia get the idea that they have a right to rule Kosovo, there's going to be problems for everyone, including the United States. Well, we must watch out for the human rights of the Serbs in Kosovo, and we must recognize the rights of the vast majority of people of Kosovo to run their country. The same as with Montenegro. We must watch out for the rights, for the human rights of the people who are minority there, the Albanian people. They have their rights, even though the majority has rights in Montenegro. This is this idea of watching out for human rights and respecting the rights of people to have their own country. It's the same thing on, 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 ver on both sides of the coin. And uh, it's, 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 we, we need to make sure, and today we're talking about something that, again, we're being, Americans aren't seeing because we're lulled to sleep, thinking everything's okay. Well, everything's not okay. Obviously, there's some problems with the way, number one, the Serbs think they're gonna take over Kosovo again, and number two, the way Albanian, the Albanian minority is being mistreated, or the way they are being treated, I should say, in Montenegro. And I, am, I don't know anything firsthand, and I'm very anxious to hear uh, some of the firsthand testimony of what's that about. And our allies, Mr. Chairman, just as we are allies in the Congress, America's allies are those people who accept those principles. 
You may not be American citizens, but anyone who believes in liberty and justice for all is our ally. And that's what this is about. So looking forward to the testimony. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for Joe and Shirley for all the hard work that they've done to make sure that uh, guys like me who uh, are very busy get our attention directed to important things. And you know, we're so busy without Joe and Shirley, we'd miss some very important things. We appreciate their hard work. So thank you very much. Uh, Congressman Rohrabacher and I will have to be resuming our voting and Uh, our next witness will be uh, Shirley Cloyes, uh, Balkan Affairs <coughs> Advisor of the Albanian American Civic League. I think that Dana Rohrabacher's comment um, earlier today is very important for all of us to remember, and I was glad Congressman Rohrabacher was able to join us on a very difficult day for California and members of the California delegation. Um, he said that this briefing is absolutely critical because it tells Serbia and Montenegro that the U.S. government is watching. And I would add that it's, it's critical because it tells the entire international uh, community that we are going to be watching human rights abuses and the gap between a government's professed positions and adherence to international law and its actions. Part of the problem, I think, in the international community and in the development of our foreign policy, which is the main thing I'm going to, to address, and I'm going to hand my comments um, for the record and, and summarize them here, is that I think we have it all wrong when it comes to Balkan policy. We're repeating the failed policy of the past, which is to keep whatever is left of the former Yugoslavia together at all costs, and we're ignoring the anti-Albanian racism that lies at the heart of the problem. In the beginning of the annexation of Albanian lands in Montenegro, um, by Montenegro, um, through the ascent of the so-called great powers in 1878, you have a path that starts out with actual genocide. And my, my testimony documents that. The only thing that I want to bring to the attention of this um, assembled body now is a very famous massacre at Tivar when 4,300 Kosovar Albanians who were anti-fascist troops being gathered by the Montenegrin and Serbian military supposedly to fight in the last days against Hitler were lured to Tivar, uh, Montenegro, massacred on the spot. Their bodies were dumped into a quarry. I only learned about this a year ago from a member of the board of the Albanian American Civic League. It was forbidden to discuss this on pain of persecution and death. And I was very fortunate this summer to meet Aizem Hadini, one of the few survivors, a lawyer who lives in Kosovo and has written this comprehensive account. It's only now, think about it. So this will be coming to the attention of the world because we will be translating this book into English and trying to uncover a buried history. After the, um, once the communist era ensues, then the patterns that we've talked about today here at this hearing of forced assimilation and immigration and the resettlement of Albanian lands by Montenegrin Slavs begins in earnest. And I'm not going to go into all the details that I've accounted for based on our delegation um, or on the ones that are included in a report that, I, however, I would like to submit for the re record. It's a report on the status of Albanians in Montenegro that will, I think, um, be a good adjunct to Anton Leitchi's report. It documents the confiscation of land uh, in detail, the highlights of it, and forced immigration patterns we in the modern era. That. I'll make sure that we include that as part Thank of the you. record. As this well. is written by Nicole Varishai, um, in uh, Montenegro an educator, and signed by several people Montenegrin professionals, including Suma Dubretsi, who addressed Congressman Lantos this summer. One of the comments, though, and it's a side comment to a very factual report that this includes, is an incredible comment that I think captures the heart of what's going on. He said they, meaning the Montenegrin Slavs, have taught their children to hate ours and our children to hate ourselves themselves. And one of the things that did not come out completely, I think, in some of the earlier remarks is the absolute extent 
of anti-Albanian racism and the effort to make Albanian children feel that they are less than human beings. One of the members of our board who is sitting in our audience today, um, uh, Faro Jambalai, told me about the uh, forced immigration of one of his relatives and who overheard the Montenegrin military saying, we are moving the animals tonight. There are patterns of forced immigration. There, uh, Montenegro is unfortunately a center of, of activity in illegal documents and immigration is encouraged. And if you are not asked to escort it out, especially if you've been an opponent, Maras Tsulai is here, he almost uh, didn't make it out of the country for being a dissenter. He is also on our board. If that doesn't happen, what happens is a denial of resources. You've heard about the educational system, but also the denial of basic resources, such as water, running water, and electricity, and phone lines. Another incident that happened this summer that really grasped the heart of, of the issue, and I'll start to close now, is that all nation states seek some type of political control and engage in, a, in a, um, an attempt to respond to the needs of the majority group. But not all nation states engage in the kind of demographic engineering that Montenegro has engaged in which is what has led to the uh, population being diminished by 50% since World War II and in some areas even more so just in the last 10 years. And it's very instructive that this summer members of the Albanian American Civic League were in one of the Albanian villages in Italy. Italy has 15, 51 Albanian villages. Albanian is an official language in Italy. But, but Italy does not view the expression of language and heritage as a threat to its nation state. It views it as something that enriches it. This is exactly the opposite of what is happening. And I think we have to speak with um, a lot of our own official um, community about the language that we're using in human rights discourse. There is no language that seems adequate to capture this situation. Which leads me to my final point about how we have constructed Balkan policy since um, the fall of Milosevic. We have continued to allow, I believe, the central problems to persist. Anti-Albanian racism and the quest for a greater Serbia. In the context of um, what has happened um, in the post-war era, we have allowed the Serbian propaganda machine to create a false parity between the victim and the perpetrator, and that has happened with the assent of many members of the European community. And unfortunately, the Bush administration wanting to take a backseat to Europe has gone along with this. Within this context, we hear the language of reconciliation and of conflict resolution, but that approach will not solve the problem and bring justice to the region. Only an independent Kosovo will bring justice to the region. Only, finally, the denazification and the democratization of Serbia will bring justice to the region. Time is running out once again in the Balkans. And I must say that it will only be the moral and political courage of people like Congressman Lantos in the US Congress that will make a difference. In the case of Albanians in Montenegro, it will be decisive. Unless there is a change in the human rights status, unless uh, the international community is willing to grapple with the gross denial of human and civil rights, Albanians in Montenegro will cease to exist within two decades. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so program. much for your testimony. We appreciate the effort that the Albanian American Civic League, Joe, you and, and Shirley have made in terms of bringing this information to our attention. It's extremely important that we know what's happening and we appreciate that. Joe, do you want to make a comment? We, yes. We've sort of shortchanged you and... Uh, well, I, I really didn't want to give testimony because it was just too good, but I think while there are representatives from the Montenegro government here, that we should be honest with them and tell them things that I saw specifically 
And I'd like to just put this on the record. When we got to Flavie Gusin, the local political leader there, Tahir Jambalai, was so upset. Now, it happened to be a, a coincidence that that day, there was an opening of a border between Montenegro and Albania. And mind you now, we are talking about opening up a border between Albanian lands. Don't forget, these Albanian lands that Montenegro has today were, I believe, illegally annexed back in 1878. But forget that. We cannot go back and change history. We're looking for the establishment of international law there today. But imagine having a celebration opening up a border between Albanian lands, which will benefit Montenegro, because now there'll be business coming from the Albanian side to Montenegro. And the Albanian political leader gave me his seat at the table so I could see what was going on firsthand. And guess what I witnessed? I witnessed a cultural celebration where the costumes are Montenegrin, the songs are in Serbian, Montenegrin, and they happen to be songs which are ultra-nationalist about how we took the land from the Albanian people. And no Albanian was able to dress up in an Albanian costume. No Albanian was able to speak except the mayor from the region who calls himself a Bosniak, but apparently he was an Albanian about 100 years ago, but he's already been assimilated. These people used to speak Albanian, but they've been part of the process of assimilation, so now they're Bosniaks. So in an Albanian area called Plavi Gusin, you have a Bosniak mayor that sympathizes with them, obviously, because he was a pretty good man, and he has no control over anything. So here I had to sit there and watch the insults and the embarrassment against the Albanian people opening up a border between two Albanian lands. There's the government of Albania, there's the government of Montenegro, and they don't allow any of the Albanian language or culture there. Totally Montenegrin Slav. Why is that? Are they so insensitive to who the Albanian people are? Are they just trying to continue sending a signal that we don't want you here? And the result is obvious. 50,000 Albanians have left since 1945. Now, isn't that interesting that the population of Albanians in Montenegro has dropped 50% from 1945 when they have the highest birth rate in Europe? You would think that it would have doubled since 1945. It should have increased, yeah. It, it's not because they are forcing them out in this very quiet type of ethnic cleansing. And obviously, I wish we had another hearing, and you should. Go to the government of Montenegro, have Congressman Lantos do it, and have their people come here and answer these specific things. We, we don't want this to be a one-sided uh, hearing, but I think it's important that this be put on the record because it's never been done before. Yeah, we, we appreciate it, and all of these materials will be put in the record. We appreciate the effort that you've put into this. The important message that I think comes out of this discussion that we've had here today is, first of all, that human rights are important that human rights and the recognition of the rights of, of ethnic communities must be recognized. That's an essential part if we're to achieve uh, any kind of, of peace and reconciliation in the very troubled part of the world that Montenegro is located in. The second thing that I think is an important message that needs to come out of this hearing is that we here in the United States Congress are watching what is going on in Montenegro. We are concerned about what happens there. We are concerned with the implications of what happens there in terms of the future of that region and in terms of stability in that part of Europe. We are concerned. We will continue to watch what happens. And it's important that the Montenegrin government know that this is an area and issue of concern and that we are concerned about, about this. It's also important that the government of Serbia and other cover, uh, countries in that area know as well that these are issues that we are focusing on that we're going to give attention to.